around when you start? Yes, please, Gaurav. All right, perfect. Uh, thanks everyone for joining on Monday morning. Uh, we'll do a quick recap and then uh, we will proceed with our day two. So as you guys remember, uh, we talked about design thinking is all about doing. Essentially, we talked about a few um, principles slash mindsets. We talked about starting with human beings, people with their needs, possibilities, experiences, and knowledge uh, as a starting point for all considerations. We also talked about uh, understanding people's pleasures uh, or gains frustrations or pains and uh, have tasks to be fulfilled. So essentially, what are the pains that we're trying to figure out, uh, fix into gains or turn into gains is what we'd uh, focus on. And then we also um, talked about another uh, mindset, which is what we're going to touch upon today is bias towards action. So in design thinking, it is not based on lengthy considerations by somebody who sits alone behind the closed doors, but we would essentially talk about how do we work with other human beings and design solutions in order to solve problems, right? So the story so far, uh, what we have worked upon was we talked about our mission uh, is to develop teams who believe that the world can be a better place uh, and that they can be ones to make it happen. Unless you believe in this, uh, there won't be any possibility of how you implement design thinking in your day-to-day -day lives. So believing in this is the most critical piece. Instead of being trend-focused, uh, we are focused on students, teachers, content creators, etc., and are always iterating ourselves as an organization to best serve their needs. To do that, we use process, and the process, what we are talking about here, is essentially design thinking, right? Um, now, meaning is what we also touched upon, that everything that we design needs to embody uh, the core meaning of that the users are seeking. Uh, essentially, delivering uh, meaning cannot be an afterthought, which means that, um, we focus on how do we create meaningful solutions uh, from day one. And uh, meaning could be the guiding and the driving force within each of us. Uh, it's what helps us value ourselves and that products and companies that we interact with. We also touched upon, if you guys remember, about uh, the brand loyalty and, and, and other topics, which essentially comes from meaning, right? Without meaning, we are missing the heart of what the users are looking for, no matter what the industry we are in, whether we're creating products, services, tools, processes, policies, whether we have an enterprise or consumer focus um, organization, no matter, no matter what our role is, uh, we have the opportunity to drive successful business results uh, in a way that, all, that also impacts people's lives. If you guys remember, we talked about two different, primarily two different types of design. Um, the one that is a designer design and the one that is silent design. And what we wanted to focus on is silent design, which essentially allows behavioral changes and it builds needs within the, uh, within the people. Apart from solving problems, it also, uh, helps create more needs in the in the market. Um, these were some of the pieces that we also uh, discussed that design is all around us. It is it satisfies needs, it creates a value, it changes behavior, and it involves people. We talked about mindsets and the beginner mindset is what we stressed upon. We said rather than focusing on I know, we should now be focusing on I wonder which creates uh, a lot of opportunities in the way we think, we uh, execute uh, uh, our day-to-day -day activities, uh, in the way we communicate with people. And uh, I wonder really opens up the gates for experts as well as newcomers. If your mindset is unprejudiced, 
it is open to everything in a beginner's mind there are many possibilities but in an expert's mind there are only a few so that so trying to be expert but having this mindset really helps uh, uh, individuals we also touched upon these uh, mindsets and we said focus on people which i just covered in my initial slide uh, driven by curiosity creating awareness uh, of the problem uh, is very important uh, having an interdisciplinary team so that it's not just a designer's job to design solutions but essentially collaborating with the team and and um, having a holistic consideration of problem statement as well as the solution really helps trying to be experimental and iterative of course we all understand that uh, one important piece was trying to be mindful of the process um, since it was not a linear step-by-step -step process it is something that is a mishmash of back and forth between different stages or phases of design thinking uh, trying to be mindful of the process is a key so that you don't get overwhelmed with just trying to create the best solution out there you are actually trying to um, ensure that you also keep a tap on the on the innovation side also keep a tap on uh, the the timelines the project deliverables and everything else right communication of your ideas into more show and tell in a visual way uh, rather than writing stories, creating, uh, I mean, user stories. Uh, we use stories rather, we use visualizations, we use journeys, um, and we try to be as visual as possible, whatever we're thinking in, the, in our heads, writing it down, creating a visual around it, using sticky notes, whatever is, whatever works for us, and trying to create a value proposition and a vision of that idea uh, really helps to communicate what is exactly needed uh, or what we are thinking in our heads, which really helps align everybody uh, into what's going on in your head. Uh, and then there were other ones like bad towards action, which I covered in my initial slide and accepting the complexity uh, is really important, right? Um, all right uh then of course uh uh user-centered design is what is the core for your design thinking where it revolves around what works best for the users and understand their pain points and motivations really help you create what exactly is our is our is our uh solution going to be like now with that we move forward with uh the next stage, which was empathy. And if you guys remember, we broke it down into two. Uh, the first one was understand, and the second one was observe. So understanding and observing helps us build empathy. We broke it down into two phases in, in our design council at Learning Mate, and there was a reason behind that. Uh, so that we have a clear understanding phase as well as a clear observation phase. Uh, really helps with the kind of business we are in and the kind of people that we deal with and the kind of customers that we have right? uh, with a clear input and output between uh, both these phases or sub phases rather right um, so before we jump into the uh, the specificities of what understand is and what the tools uh, are uh, this is the time we start talking about tools and templates uh, but before we do that, I'll share. I'd want to play two videos for you. Um, it'll really help uh, set the premise. So let me pause my screen sharing here and then I'll share my screen once again. All right.
Are you guys able to hear the audio as well? No audio, Zoro. Still no audio? Yeah, we could hear it now. Okay, cool. So I don't know if you guys just noticed there was one smart donkey who removed this uh, wooden piece, uh, wooden piece which was blocking their way. Um, we look at the second one now. Make sense. It makes total sense. You just open up your mind no, and you listen to other people's opinions. That that what's going on here? What's going on? Being ridiculous. I'm being ridiculous. You're the one that thinks Bro, that. how can you not see Okay, it? boys, calm down. Okay, everybody take your seats. Matthew, John, come up here, please. And John, stand over there and face that direction. Matthew, come over here and just do the opposite. Thank you. Okay, boys, turn around. John, what color is the ball? The ball is white. Seriously? Bro, do you just like making things difficult? Well, what color do you say the ball is? Black. The ball is black, clearly. I don't know what you see around, but the ball is white. Without looking at the ball, I want you to both switch places. Okay, both of you, please turn around. And what color is the ball now? Okay, please have a seat. Throughout our lives, we believe many things, and we hold dear what we think is right and true. But at times, there'll be others who disagree with us. What we believe to be 100% right, they believe the opposite just as strongly. Well, how can that be? Can't they see? We can become frustrated, we might grow distant, we may even sever relationships entirely. Slow down. Breeze. Step into the other person's shoes. To make all the difference. All right, let's talk a little bit about this. So um Okay, so did you guys watch the first video where there were there was a queue of Donkeys who was trying who was trying to open a gate and get out get on the other side. Um, any observations on that video? What exactly uh, was that video talking about? Before we get to this one, anyone? So, so it's in the first video I observed that the first uh, donkey he was tried and then but he jumped on that the 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 wooden stick. Uh, and the second one, he followed the exactly the same thing which the uh, the first donkey has done. But the third one, he thought, and then he seen the obstacle, and possibly he has removed that, and he just got the way. That's our observe. Okay, good one. Anyone else? Not follow the same thing as other thing or smart old. Okay. Um, any other thoughts before I add what I was I, I understood from that video? So there is a problem uh, from the third donkey that he can't uh, jump over the uh, bar and uh, he just put it off and uh, so it is it, it is easy to it is easy to for the third one that to uh, drop the bar and go on. Uh, okay. Making path easy. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, make uh, making path easy. All right. So the process is making a process easy for others also. All right. Uh, anyone else? So the third donkey he has actually observed that what the other first two donkeys are doing it, and that is that is why he could see the solution. Okay. All right. So there are there are like multiple things that come out of that video. The first is 
the first few initial donkeys didn't really focus on what the problem was. The problem was to go on the other side. And they had taken a path that was followed by the one in front of them, and they just followed blindly. The one in the end was actually trying to focus on what the problem was. The problem was to go on the other side, and there could be like mother, uh, so many possible ways to get on the other side, right? Which was to have a clear understanding of what the problem was and then trying to solve it rather than just following, right? Also, uh, it also somewhere tells us that there are multiple solutions of solving the problem. Uh, no solution is right. Uh, we as designers tend to get married to our ideas and solution all the time, where whatever we have created becomes our own piece in our heads. And we say that this is my design, and this is my product, and this is my solution, and this is my uh, creation, so to speak. Uh, but essentially, it is not. Uh, and that's what we need to keep in mind. Uh, so uh, the other thing that came out of it was uh, was uh, also to have a point of view uh, rather than trying to be uh, following others. It is also to have a point of view. Now, it may or may not work. Right, um, but essentially having a point of view and expressing that and trying to um, talk about it or at least lay down on the table is really important. Right, so essentially it's all it all it, it somewhere talked about the problem and then having multiple solutions to a problem and also not trying to um, follow. Uh, everyone else uh, when trying to create a solution. Of course, there has to be. And if you guys remember, there was this whole um, um, uh, double diamond design kind of a thing, which is also somewhere uh, uh, laying on top of the design thinking uh, process where you converge and then you, you diverge and then you convert. So it's all about divergent thinking to start with and then coming together as a, as a, as a convergent mindset uh, to create something that works for everybody, right? Um, any observations on the second one where we were we, we saw that uh, there were a bunch of people uh, in a room and two guys were fighting over something. And then the professor came in and he tried to um, prove a point. Um, and any observations on the second one? So I observed that it's in the first two, uh, it's in the second scenario where the two people, the two students or maybe the two people, they are fighting with each other because they are believing in their perspective that what they are saying is the right thing. And they're not agree and they're not listening to each other. So it is like not the, having the proper conversation, neither they're understanding each other problem. But when the professor came in, so he, uh, he uh, sh shown the ball. And possibly that ball is one side is a white and the other side is a black. It is uh, holding the symbol like the we two different have the two different perspective. And maybe we are right for uh, what we are saying. But we also need to see from the other side, like what other person is saying. And we can see from that perspective. Thanks. All right, anyone else? I have observed that there is a, just one word that is uh, why. So why others are telling different from me? So that's the main part. Yeah, and acknowledging that there would be there would be conflicts and there would be different point of views and opinions uh, is the first step towards trying to be empathetic about others. Um, yeah, uh, anyone else? I know it's Monday morning, but still, anyone expanding the vision? Yes. All right. So um, the second video primarily talked about um, the second phase of uh, the empathy, which was primarily around observing, uh, which somewhere tells us that there would be difference of opinions. There would be 
places where we'll have to also try to uh, also try and understand what others feel and what they believe in and uh, there is always uh, something that we call as truth right your truth might not be my truth right so understanding and acknowledging is the first step um, so um, there was this uh, there was this webinar that i had done long back where we were talking about inclusive design right and we were trying to um, uh, talk about certain aspects of that and essentially it was all about can we create inclusive design and what's the process and what's the step towards that uh, and the first step is to acknowledge that there are biases and there are places where we are not inclusive so having acknowledgement itself is the first step where we would then try and understand where we are going wrong and then try to solve it rather than saying that we'd want to build empathy uh, or we'll try to be inclusive in our design we'd want to uh, include all aspects uh, for all different types of users in our design solutions uh, having an acknowledgement itself is the key everyone's truth when they speak is their own truth but essentially is that the holistic piece uh, does everyone believe in it maybe not right so acknowledging it itself is a is a is a is the first big step that we need to take all right um so we would get into the understanding first and there are multiple ways to do that the first thing that we talked about is to have a clear goal of what we are trying to achieve so good understanding of a problem is the be all and end all of design thinking now please understand this is a big statement one uh, for us to start with having a clear definition of what we are trying to solve is the key uh, to design thinking you can try and implement as many things as you can as many tools as many processes within design thinking to create the best solution out there if your problem statement is not clear if you don't have a common design challenge that you're trying to solve then it is not going to be successful so in the understand phase we want to make ourselves familiar with the problem in order to uh, substan substantiate the design challenge we formulate a question also referred to as the problem statement now please understand when a customer comes to us or when a stakeholder comes to us or when a project sponsor comes to us and they tell us a problem please understand that what they're saying and what they're believing are two different things and what people say and what they believe and what how they act are three different things i mean nobody in the world would do the same thing which is saying which is believing and which he, how he's going to act upon it right um so that's where observe comes into place but essentially when somebody says a problem statement um uh, right it they, they're what they're thinking and what they're saying are two different things through various techniques and tools the problem statement can be broadened and also narrowed down now broadened why because we want to also get the bigger picture in place and also try and make it more specific as we narrow it down so sometimes the problem statements are given to us which are which are very very vague right i want to build say um uh a tool that would allow me to transform my content from one format to another what does this mean this mean 10000 things i can create a project within a a week and do that transformation and i can spend maybe a year to build that transformation utility which might not be even successful because i have created something which is not what was expected right think about when we are asked to create uh, or uh probably give some estimates for a solution right uh, that you you i mean there is a problem please give us an estimate on how much time you would take to solve this problem now with without a clear problem statement and without a common understanding and when i say clear problem statement it is who's saying it plus who all are involved in this so there would be a project team there would be a product team there would be a uh there would be a stakeholder uh who would be working with us right there could be smes there would be 
curriculum experts, there would be content experts, there would be users, right? Uh, who would actually use the solution. Sometimes we have access to the user, sometimes we don't have access to the user. But essentially, having all of them uh, help us with a common understanding of the problem statement is the key. So there are tools that we would talk about, tools such as 5W and H and 5Ys and et cetera, et cetera, are, the, are essentially the interviewing techniques which we'll um, do a deeper dive today. But essentially, uh, trying to have findings, which in turn helps us sharpen the problem statement iteratively and come with a common understanding of the problem on a team is critical. So as a common goal, all of us are working towards one problem statement rather than everyone thinking in their, uh, differently in their own heads. There, has, there have been probably 10,000 incidences where we are working with, um, say, uh, uh, an architect, right? A technical architect, or a, or a, or let's say an engineer, right? And the way we are thinking about a problem, and the way we are thinking about solving that problem, and the assumptions that we have in our heads is totally different than what he would think about, because that individual is made to think uh, more on. Uh, more on the side of uh, analytical thinking rather than trying to be creative or trying to address two specific problems that only we as individuals and let's say designers can think about, right? But also consider that we don't know everything, then the problem that was defined by the project sponsor or the customer to start with and what we have understood could also be two different things. So how do we bring everyone on the same page and create something which is common for the team, for both the teams, customer teams, our teams, and our internal teams, our technical teams, our content teams, our project management teams, everybody, is what we would learn in the problem statement. All right. Um, so <clears throat> defining a problem statement is, again, like I said, one of the key steps of design thinking. So let me again pause my screen and share a document with you, which is uh, something that you would find later on as I share it with you. All right. <clears throat> okay, so this is called uh, the problem statement. It is one of the artifacts of our uh, design council. Um, so I'll first go through why and what, and then we will uh, use the template, which is deep down in this document. So a simple sentence that coherently captures the key problem statement is what we would look for. In design thinking, a clear and comprehensive problem statement is the prerequisite for an idea generation process, right? Um, the problem statement can help define the right point of view and design the innovative, solu uh, design innovative solution. Uh, now, Always start with a problem and never a solution. Now, please understand that coming up with solutions is very, very tempting. All of us who are people who create solutions would always jump into creating a solution right away. As soon as somebody says, what do you think about building a registration module? You'd probably come up with 10,000 ideas, but it is not advisable to directly jump into solutions, right? Not to even talk about them, right? So having a clear problem statement and trying to dig deeper and understanding it and asking more questions on that is what design thinking is all about rather than focusing on solution to start with. Before we begin on a problem, to solve a problem, we must first understand it correctly. And a problem statement is the vital tool for consolidating and capturing analysis, uh, uh, capturing the analysis results. Why have a clear problem statement? As I talked about it, in developing a shared understanding of the problem with stakeholders, and we will in a while talk about who the stakeholders are and why is it critical to understand who your stakeholder is. But um, for, the, um, for the focus of this document itself, um, developing a shared understanding with anyone who's part of the project could be termed as the stakeholder. In planning the collective findings, from the problem analysis in a design challenge and in developing a success criteria, which essentially would be the success 
uh, factor by which you're going to measure your solution. So if you haven't designed, defined what your problem statement is and what your success exit criteria for that design challenge is, then whatever you're designing would never be measured in a way that you would want to eventually, right? So somebody might come back to and tell you that this didn't work out the way we expected. What did not work out? Why it did not work out, right? We didn't know, we, we would never know and we would never be able to answer that unless we know what the challenge is and what we are trying to solve and how we're trying to solve, right? Now let's look at the template itself, right? But, but before we get into the template, there are these potential six types of questions that we could ask in order to define a problem statement. So the following questions, which are comprised of what, why, who, when, where, and how, would really help you define a problem statement. And it could be not just one statement, it could be a set of statements that would define a challenge. So what is the problem? Why is it a problem? Who has the problem? Who has the need? Who has the problem and who has a need are two different things. Please understand that there are two different things here. Uh, the problem could be with the organization or with the with the customer, but it might not be the need of the user. Now, having a clear understanding of the problem and the need. Now, there could be a lot of scenarios where the prob the the problem is with the actual user. So, a student might be struggling with figuring out the a button which would help him give a hint for a question but the need is not with the project sponsor right so there are two different uh, uh, things here very uh, there's a very um, finite line in between but there are two different things uh, when and where does the problem occur of course understanding the uh, environment in which the problem occurs right there have been lots of incidences where we are working with our internal teams and they have defined a solution, but they never knew that that piece of interactive or um, let's say um, a simulation that was created would probably end up in an iframe, which is 400 by 500 pixels and it would open in a learning management system after two pop-up clicks and essentially uh, it would not be uh, available on mobile devices and there are so many things to understand before we really start designing it to understand about the environment so when and where does the problem occur is is very very critical and then how is it solved today so there are problems and the users are very smart and they have figured out a way to solve the problem so how exactly is that solved today in absence of a solution how do they go about it today Right, that is also a big question to get answers for. All right, so here's the template. So we ask some initial questions, like I said, why, who, what, where, when, and how. And uh, we write all the questions, and basically we write the responses in these boxes here at the bottom. Right, this would help us have a common understanding of. Why is it a problem? Who has the problem? What is the problem? Who has the need? When does it occur? Where does it occur? And how is it solved today? As a team, when you look at these responses that you've gathered from various people, right? Whoever you, whoever has the understanding of this problem, right? You can have a common understanding and create problem statements in a common format. And the common format is how might we? And we'll talk about how might we, but essentially the template here says that. Uh, let me zoom in a bit, right? So how might we, what, for actor and so problem to be solved? That's the that's the format which really helps everybody read in the similar syntax as a statement, and then we try and solve it. Now please understand the problem statement cannot be a paragraph. It cannot be words. It has to be a sentence in a, in a specific format. Now, there are multiple thought processes and multiple ways where people try and solve it. I have personally used How Might We in a lot of ways, and it has really helped. There are people who use jobs to be done. There are other techniques of writing it. People write user stories. People write uh, use scrum techniques to uh, solve uh, or have a common problem statement. But essentially, this helps 
for at least uh, the projects that I work with or the people that I work with because you don't have to be a designer or you don't have to be probably somebody who understands Jira or somebody understands Confluence or the Scrum methodologies. This is plain English, which is neither design nor technology somewhere sits in between. So how might we build something for a user so that it solves a problem that we would have defined somewhere here, right? So this is the template that we use. And I would really encourage you guys to use something similar. Now, you can use exactly this template, but please understand design thinking is not about using templates. It's, it's about the idea behind the tools. So this is a tool. You may want to use it. It works really well. And if you want to, I would really encourage, please use it. But if you are able to get answers for these questions, if you're able to create a common problem statement that everybody agrees upon as a stakeholder in your project, it is good enough. It doesn't have to be this purple and blue and gray and black. It could be any format as long as you have all of these captured. All right. Now, the again, like I said, the success criteria for it would be the ones mentioned here that you need to make it simple and it has to be clear within the stakeholders and how does it help it needs to help in these certain ways all right any questions on this before i move forward okay, did you guys um... understand or is it confusing Okay, so this is Rupali. Uh, I have a question. Um, so if you are saying that, uh, okay, so this is a definition of a problem statement, right? And uh, the definition of a success criteria would be somewhere different. Yes, so problem statement will yeah. give us a success criteria. The problem statement would not be the success criteria. The yeah. problem statement would be the problem that we're trying to solve. And with that, we would come out with a success criteria that we want um this much of retention and this much of uh, tasks to be completed and so on and so forth things that could be measured when we do usability analysis or tests or run analytics report on top of what we are doing correct so just about only about the problem statement right in the past whenever um, i have had an experience of definition of a problem statement there is de uh, definitely as you said right a problem statement comes from somebody usually and that source could be different it could be either your customer it could be your uh, the owner of the product it could be just anybody now yeah. and then when you're defining and when you say <clears throat> okay let's just look at the problem statement uh, from different perspectives you bring um, everybody's understanding your team's definition of you know what the problem statement is that is what you say and how do you have uh, in your experience of handling this um how do you think the problem statement has to be defined right so would you say okay if you have a team working as a designer uh you have a design team uh who's working so and it could be a mix of different um skills uh and you say okay let's just start defining the problem do you bring it on a session together of definition would you want them to write a problem statement separately come together and commonly define it how what is your experience so i think i would start with the person who's giving the problem so that at least he and i or she and i understand what we're trying to solve at times you would see that you've understood something which is what somebody said but please remember i said what he says and what he believes are two different things so as soon as you start showing some designs on wireframes or prototypes, you would hear things which were never considered or which were never explained, right? Which increases the time for you to design something because the scope suddenly changed. So the whole idea behind problem statement is not just for me as a designer, but also for the project owner or the product owner and the sponsor and my other teams who are, say, the technical teams or the business analyst teams and all of them to have a common understanding of what we're trying to solve. Now, what happens is that usually I've seen that 
the design team gets questioned for not creating things on time and it is taking way too much time to solve this particular problem especially with the customers right <clears throat> because everything starts with uh, an estimation and we say that okay we'll take three weeks to solve this we'll run a design sprint we'll do this 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 and we'll, we'll create mockups and we'll be in front of you and then you can uh, we'll have two rounds of iterations or feedbacks and then we will finalize on a solution right it never happens like that so this tool essentially is to bring everyone on the same page right from the customer to the person who created the problem who defined it for us and the people who are going to work on it multiple uh, departments i have usually used this as part of stand-ups as part of any meeting uh, that we can bring in multiple stakeholders the important ones we don't have to bring in the whole 15 odd member team it essentially is the few, few key people as soon as you kick start on a problem that's where all the people meet and say that this is what the problem was it was defined is it okay and does everyone have a common understanding by writing it by ourselves into the specific formats if we don't know the answers then we ask those questions in these specific formats so that we can define the problem statement essentially right and then use a meeting or an email or i mean i've used it in different formats but essentially sending it out so that everyone agrees it could be a, a page in a confluence where we say this is the problem statement and this is where we kick start this and move forward with the next steps right it is also something that is mandatory when you run a design sprint now i also understand that we would never be able to define problem statements for every small little thing that we do right sometimes the problems are too small sometimes it is a very very clear ask right maybe a story that we want to work upon but it is up to you when you would want to use this because anything that is substantial which is unclear and it is big enough or important enough to define a problem to input for that is the time we use this tool because people would get annoyed when you say i want to add replace this button and do something else with it that's not where we would use this tool because it might be as simple and straightforward which is written in a story if it cannot be written in a story if we don't know what we are trying to solve as design teams then we use this I hope I answered your question. It was too long. Yes, yes Gaurav. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Gaurav, I have one question. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is little, uh, This is related to exactly the same problem statement and uh, those problems. Uh, but it is slightly uh, different. So it's in my mind when we are talking, I was thinking about the Ola and Uber. So when they these people, they came and I'm here, uh, I wanted to confirm my understanding about this one. So Ola and Uber, when they came and they researched in India, in India, they realized so many problems like uh, our roads, the the traffic, and the uh, the core problem where like it's in the monsoon when the people are not getting the ride and all the stuff. I mean, like that. So if you see that, let's example, they have. Uh, understand 50 problems not every problem is an important problem the primary problem they might have filtered it out and they have say five to six problems are the main goes to for the problem statement right so when they are working mm -hmm. on that so how they might mm -hmm. have defined like because this five problem has the equal weightage in my understanding like tracking uh the vehicle which is not the earlier things or maybe the road uh won't uh, have common weightage currently. It won't oh, have okay. common weightage, and that's the answer, right? Why? Because from when you're trying to define a problem, so for example, right, you're you're trying to launch a company like Ola or Uber, right? That's the point you're talking about a problem statement, right? At right. that point in time, there would be people from business, there would be people from technology, there would be people who have invested in the company who would want to define the problem for you, and who would want to work on a set of high priority problems right, rather than solving all 10,000 things. Okay. So those five or three or two things become your problem statements. That is what you work upon. If 
like I said, if you are not able to write it into three or four bullet points, then it is a too large a problem and it needs its own pathways to solve them. It cannot be solved into this one big problem statement. You know what I'm saying? So for example, yeah. Yeah. if you're talking about weather conditions and you want to solve that problem, probably you're talking about a driver or Ola driver, which would have an umbrella and he would open the umbrella and pick up somebody from his home and bring him to the car. That's a different problem, right? It is not this problem. The problem here is something that everyone from top to bottom agrees upon to solve it right now. And that is what your problem statement would look like as a prioritized problem statement rather than all the problems. Hmm. So because it would be very, again, very, very tempting to solve all the problems at once with that one screen or one module that you're trying to create, but you cannot. And that is what this helps you because in a meeting, people would talk about 10,000 things, but essentially you're trying to solve only two or three. Those ideas are future phases and that's where this helps. Yes. Yes. Right. So for this, when I went into a project, people would say, I want to create an adaptive system which would have uh, machine learning. It would help teachers to define, uh, to, uh, to personalize content, and it would also have AI based recommendations. This is a five year long project. Please understand. Hmm. I'm not solving that problem. I'm trying to solve the first problem. I want to have a capability where the teachers can personalize content for students. Hmm. That's my problem that I'm solving right now. True. Everything else is future statement that yes. I would solve as future problems, not today's yes. problem. Yes, yes. But then uh, also, th sorry, that's just the last one for this one. So mm -hmm. the thing is, right. like, let's example, there are the three or four. These are the major challenge they wanted to solve when they are doing the research. So every time for the one big problem, they are going through the same thing, like the problem statement writing and then they are following the procedure and then the second problem statement they are writing and they, they are following the same statement that that's what you are saying you are saying okay yes okay. i i am saying that what you're talking about are basically goals and outcomes what i'm talking about is a problem rather than goals and outcomes goals and outcomes for an organization to solve could be ten thousand things right now i'm focused on solving one or two problems max or three which are interrelated okay. and could be solved at this point in time with the with the budget that I have and with the timeline that I have it at hand. Yeah. Right. If I want yes. to come launch a company like Ola or Uber, I would probably get three months to build an ecosystem, build an application and launch it and do test runs for next three months. And the investors would be sitting on your head saying that I want to launch this company in the next six months. If I sit and solve all the problems, it would take me two years to at least build that application and the infrastructure and do a service design for it, never get launched. Sure, sure, got you, thank you. All right, so next two. Yeah, just before we move ahead. Um, when you define a problem statement, right, before, so is it appropriate to say that there is a research that is already done? There is a discovery that is already done. There is uh, no. Okay. So then, uh, is it also? Uh, is it if I put a statement that okay, there is some amount of research that is done, and there is some amount of problems that are vaguely defined, and after the problem statement is defined, there is some amount of research that again will come in play because you have to do adequate research to you know proceed. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So like I said, if you remembered and I and I categorically said that it is an iterative process to fine tune on my design problems or the problem statements. As soon as I kickstart a project, I would have a problem statement and these five questions would probably an be answered by one person and he might only have answers for three questions out of those six ones that I laid out. Right. And with that, I'm going to write a problem statement as I dig deeper. I would refine this into something that I would want to use for my definition phase, which becomes my definition that I'm trying to solve, and then essentially use it for my design phase. So there would be things that would refine this problem statement even further. But what is the problem today? What do people understand right now so that it would lead me into the research that I would want to do? What am I going to research upon? Nothing, right? So essentially, this helps me to have an understanding of as of today, then it would get refined. Yeah. 
Got it. All right, cool. The next thing that I would want to talk about is design principles. Now, every product, every uh, company, every thing that we work upon, we need to define the design principles if they don't exist right now. Uh, now, these would be some of the guiding principles that we would use to solve problems staying within a boundary because you have to always stay within the boundary and adhere to certain things which essentially belongs to the brand that you work for or you're going to work for, right? Now, primarily, every organization has some principles. If they don't, then it's more like a workshop to define what the principles would be. But keeping them in mind while you are proceeding with your research, with your next set, next set of steps, step, steps, or observing people in the in the in the in the time of research that you're doing and coming up with solutions, design principles become some of your guidelines that you're going to always think about, right? These are some of the things that we had as part of the design council created. You would see some of the commonalities like beginner's mindset, guess less, guess less and ask as many questions as you can in order to learn. Show and tell, again, common, like you saw in the design thinking uh, slides. These are the traits, which essentially are the mindsets, right? These are the common ones. But the principles itself are at the bottom, right? So at Learning Mate, uh, these are some of the principles that we defined that would be used for any solution that we design for Learning Mate, not for our customers, but for Learning Mate. Users and business are the key. So in order to build relationships with the users uh, with a great design, the informed design is a powerful differentiator for business and understanding of the business goals and audience, it, it is a must. Now, problem statement itself is a place where you would have common understanding with the business. If you're trying to create a tool system process or a software or a product for learning mate these are the things that we always keep in mind inclusivity is again one of the big second principles which is very very important that we keep in mind because of the domain that we are in it has to be universal it has to be inclusive so we design for everybody now Design for everyone doesn't mean that you're only talking about accessibility here. Please understand. Design for everyone also means the different types of users that you would have. There would be extreme users and there would be lead users. And we'll shortly talk about what that means. Having an understanding of who the users are, who are the extreme ones, who are the lead ones, and who are the people that we're designing for and how do we create a solution that works for everyone is what we are going to use for this particular principle reusability is important that is where we stress upon using design patterns using using atomic design patterns there are so many tools out there we've done it on multiple products right now if you're not doing it i would really really request you guys and urge you to use it use xd use uh, sketch use uh, whatever tools you use right um, miro or whatever i mean figma there are so many tools out there and everyone supports atomic design which essentially means that you would have common components that you can design and then use it for your screens and you can have common layouts that you can use for replacing your um, components on those designs to build something which is uniform and it also is consistent right if there are 10 designers working on the same piece it would always be consistent because it comes from atomic design it has a design um, system sitting in the background always use standards experiment is always welcomed get inspired by how the users use the system but use standards. Now, when I say standards, there are these big giant organizations like Google and IBM and, and Microsoft and all of these people, Microsoft, have, I don't know if you guys have seen, they've come up with a, with a tool called Designer, very, very recently launched, but essentially they are the ones who have spent millions of dollars researching and defining standards. If we are designing system, a system for the web there are clear guidelines on how things should work how do we use a 
uh, a hamburger menu, where to put it, right? All of these things are very, very clearly defined. As soon as you go responsive and you go for an Android device or an iOS device, if you're on an iPad or if you are on uh, an iPhone or a Galaxy screen, um, like a tab or even a phone, right? All of them have principles defined. Now, use those standards defining your screens. I've used so many times people tend to deviate from say a bootstrap or uh, the the breakpoints between the screens and all that and creating a mess with the designs because the time it takes you to implement some of those pieces are very very extended and it becomes very ex expensive so understanding the standards is a must for somebody who's designing doing informed design always striving for getting the data from various sources in order to build a strategy and build a design it might be the case that you're only able to talk to your customer it might only be the case that you're only able to talk to the sponsor or the product owner you might be lucky to get in touch with the users don't miss that opportunity always keep asking for it in the kind of business that we have we only get a few opportunities to talk to the people because there's so many layers in between we're not working in b2c we are always b2b and that's where it becomes all the more difficult for us to get in touch with the real people. But always ask for it and strive for it. And only then you get opportunities to talk to these people. Right? But always do your research with things that we're going to talk about, like defining a problem statement. Right? Good enough to have everyone on the same page, including the customer and its stakeholders. As soon as you put a problem statement, define it for the customer, there would be so many voices within the customer's end itself that the technology team at customer or the curriculum team at the customer's end or the maybe the project team or the product team at the customer's end would create would be having arguments to define that <laughs> to help settle down on a problem statement. And it is good because you have triggered that. And it is always our responsibilities as facilitators I won't call ourselves designers, facilitators, because everyone is designing as facilitators to seed in that idea to have conversations, right? Starting with problem statement, probably, right? And of course, designing simple and being consistent, all the things that we do on top makes it consistent and making it simple is with the use of standards and trying to be solving problems rather than trying to create something which is very, very different, difficult, of course, Iteration, very, very important so that you know that even if you're designing a problem statement right now, it is designing the problem statement, it's not writing it, right? You would iterate, refine it, and as you move forward with your research, with your conversations, with the customer, you would create new versions of that, and that becomes your iteration, which means that you'd have to all the more work less on your designs and more on the on the processes before that. And there are other things which are really important, which embraces every design. And there are two things which we really have to work upon as an organization or as a design team. The first one is confidence. Every system that we design has tasks that the users want to accomplish. How do we gain confidence from the user who's going to use it? Right? All the things that you do on top would help you get that confidence. Now, please understand that our conversations with a customer or with the project sponsor are not going to give confidence. It is going to give confidence between these two teams, but the user is not going to get confident with, with that design. right? So giving a sense of autonomy uh, and uh, helping them uh, navigate through the way they have been doing on various websites and applications using the standards having clear metaphors, all of these things are going to give confidence that the user would know, if I click here, I know what the next thing is going to be, right? If I'm on a wizard, I know there are three of five steps written there, and that would really mean that I'm on, as soon as I click next, I'm going to be on the fourth one. These are the pieces that give confidence to a user in order to use a system. I just gave some random examples, but I know you understand what I'm saying. And then of course, things have to be welcoming. Anything that we do, has to be welcoming. Use prompts, use 
uh, interfaces that are friendly. Don't create something that is complex, right? Try to keep things as straightforward as it can be. Have instructions on the screen, which makes it welcoming for the users. And there are so many other ways that we use, uh, right, in order to do uh, create a design which is welcoming. But essentially, some of these small little pieces would really help you create something which is welcoming that the users would want to come back to. Right? These are some of the ones that we have defined that we should be keeping in our heads while we're designing something uh, for anything that we work upon. All right. OK, so we covered problem statement and design principles. Now we would directly jump into how do we interview people. Uh, got a, one small question. So yes. when you sort of talk about this design principle, and uh, as you mentioned that every company have the di different design principle, just mm -hmm. in a short sentence, I would like to know like how the company decide that these design principles will work for my product or my company or my clients. It is the way you would want to perceive your brand in the heads of your users. OK, got you. If you want to build a brand, what are the things that everyone should think about are the principles that are those statements that would help you define these problem statements? Sure. Sure. Thank you. All right. OK, interview to understand. The next piece, uh, and I know that we're running out of time. I'm moving too slow today, but we have lots of things to cover. So interview to understand. Now, this is not just taking an interview. There are so many best practices and tools that we'll have to use in order to Take a good interview. Now, you would be doing this at various places. You can use these techniques to talk to your product owners, your sponsors, um, your customers while defining um, problems. Of, of course, don't use it while defining problem center because they're so expensive. But as soon as you get uh, your hands on the real users, these are some of the things that we should be using. Also. Some of the things that you would see here are things that you can use on your day to day lives. It doesn't have to be for designing something. It is just to have an understanding of why we are trying to do something, right? All right. So let's dig deeper into it. So consider the problem from the point of view of the users and build empathy with the user. Understanding the user's needs, emotions, motivations, and the ways of thinking, uncover hidden insights, frustrations, motivations. And we will talk about how do we uncover it. Find out task flows, preferences, validate your assumptions, and use some of the techniques that we are going to talk about shortly, like ask five Ys and um, five W plus H. Right? Now, how to interview? Yes. Always introduce yourself and explain the problem that you're trying to solve. This is the first step of validating the, your problem statement. All right? If you are meeting somebody, tell them the context of why you're meeting them. Use an icebreaker. There are so many techniques we're not going to cover how to use icebreakers, but I'm sure you guys, all of you are uh, experienced. You've seen how to use icebreakers, but essentially use icebreakers to make the interviewee comfortable. Build a relationship. Again, very, very important piece, not just with your design, but also with the users that you have. Right, I talked about getting into the ideas of this is my design and my product and my uh, creation. Please build the relationship so that the user says that this is my software, this is my process, this is my tool, essentially. Right, But the first step is to build a relationship with the person that you're interviewing so that the interview is more effective. Explain the interview that the interview is not going to be the finding the solution. Very, very key element here, right? Not jumping into a solution. Oh, how about I create a Google integration with you when I'm trying to create a, a registration module? This is not a solution defining phase, right? You're not validating a solution with the customer or with the user. You're validating your problems with the, uh, with the user. You're validating your understanding and your assumptions rather than validating a solution. This is not the point, not the time when you validate a solution. Again, very, very tempting for people who have either started or who have been in, in probably in the, in the first five or seven years of designing. We always tend 
or even more right i i try and correct myself every time i get into a conversation with the students and teachers that somewhere i'm thinking about the solution i have to shut down that part of my brain that i don't have to think of solutions right now i am foc- i should be focused on this interview and the need for this interview rather than the need for the solution right try and understand the interviews story so please let them speak as much as possible you should be just prompting them nudging them but not really talking on this right uh many people like talking but interview is a place where or interview is a is an opportunity for you to record what they're saying do not influence them do not bring them into or give them directions for thinking uh right we normally tend to do that right in order to dig deeper we give them directions don't give them directions that is influencing you're telling them to think about a certain piece you should not be invoking that idea they should need they have to come up with that idea if they want to take a direction never do that uh because you would be always biased and you would have your assumptions in your head which you would use to give them directions never do that listen carefully and record it is always advisable that you bring somebody with you in the in the interview so that there are two people one is asking questions and one is taking notes uh or you use a recorder you use uh, some of those other tools like you get on a meeting tool like this or zoom or whatever right so that it gets recorded there are things that you would notice if you hear a recording at least two or three times that you would have ignored easily uh, while you were sitting in front of them so always record it never ask questions that could be answered in yes or no uh, so if you are asking a question which could be answered as yes or no do you live in this in 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 the city you live in bombay or calcutta the answer could be yes or no you know you're not asking that question please save time um by asking these questions you don't have to really ask these questions towards end of inter- interview try and summarize the expectations and the needs so that that point in time you validate what you've understood from that user and always allow interviewee to add uh always allow uh, allow them to add anything else that they would want to which could be the last thing that they would cover ask them are you able are, do you want to add anything more to what i have just asked right now some of the trips some of the tricks and tips always plan an interview write down a set of questions that you would want to ask create a question map this could this these might be just areas that you'd want to cover don't write exact questions because you would have to create these questions on the fly based on the responses from the users there have been interviews that i have taken from two different people for the same thing and the interviews were in completely different ad, uh, directions based on the responses that came in so do not write a script that you'd want to follow just create a map do not build a question like i said capture the journey stages start from the start and go towards the end so everything that you would want to talk about would always have a journey it could be how you manage your day what are the activities that you do on a day how do you come up with uh, how do you start with this module what are the tasks that you want to establish everything as a journey so use that as stages always remember anyone who follows the guidelines can conduct interviews don't think that you are a specialist who can only do the interviews please understand that it could be anyone with a sound head above the shoulders can take interviews you don't have to be an expert there are so many people who are experts in in the in some of these techniques but anyone who can follow these guidelines that i just talked about can conduct interviews so you don't have to be in front of the users all the time it could be your business guy it could be your product guy it could be your um, project manager a business analyst it could be anyone who can ask these questions as long as they are able to follow these guidelines right always try to pair up like i said somebody who's taking an interview another guy who's taking notes and use uh empathy interviews offer unique opportunity for spending time uh with the user and listening to his or her stories and digging deeper with the techniques that we're going to use from here on all right um so very quickly there is a template that we have designed 
for every person that we take interview, we write their name, their age, their personal data, uh, right? Uh, the date that the interview was taken, how it was conducted, if physical, then the place, if remote, then the mode. We create a question map for them because this is all the information that you would have before you get into the interview, right? So you create a question map. What are the topics that you'd want to uh, discuss? What were the questions? Uh, uh, and in the format like what, how, where, and when, right? So you add these questions while you're in the interview, and based on the responses, you add the journey. You don't have to write all of this at the interview. You can always use your recording to fill this up. But essentially, the things on top, at least until the topic, has to be defined before you get into the interview. All right with whatever you've understood as journeys, as the steps that they take, and the way they solve their current problems, you men you write all of that as your uh, output, probably, and then use the pains and gains to, to define here what are they thinking, what are the problems that they were talking about, and what are the things that they use as the gains uh, from this interview, all right? Now, this is just the template what are the techniques that you're going to use so there is something called as five whys i'm sure a lot of you know this already so this technique helps us in discovering the true causes of the problem rather than what is surfaced uh, to you right there it allows you to dig deeper and know more rather than just uh, exploring the symptoms you re really get into the 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 deep down cause of the problem and you get some surprising insights about it the principle of very simple beginners mindset is what is applied here you might know the answers because you're an expert you understand education you understand user experience design right you understand the domain you understand the software or the tool or the product but please understand asking these questions would uncover things that you would have never imagined. All right. Now, how do we use the template for five eyes? It is very simple. You ask, why is the problem a problem for you? All right. There would be a response that would come in. And based on the response, right? So the first question is all about the problem definition or the description that you would have noted, right? Which is the starting point. With that, you use the second why, which essentially would be the, the, the response that would have come in to you as the answer of that question. With the second response, which is going to be the direct impact, you are again going to ask a why question. Why is that a problem to understand the cause and the effect? You again use the response to ask another why. So you probably become a Parish Raval with a question mark on his head, forehead, right? Who's really asking all the five questions in the why format rather than what and who and where to dig deeper into understanding the exact problem that the user has. Sometimes the problems are defined in such a way that it looks like a problem, but it's, it's not really a problem, right? So this really helps you dig deeper as much as possible. You can use it for any topic, try and practice it between uh, yourselves, and you would see that you are actually ringing some of the bells into the other person's head who he never visited in, in as, a, as, a, as it's somewhere sitting in his subconscious. So essentially, this becomes more like a tool that would help you dig deeper and uncover layers which you have never even thought about. All right. Any questions until now before I proceed? No questions at all. All right. Perfect. The second technique is 5W and H, which essentially is a different format than 5Ys. Again, similar, but a little different to somewhere capture more things rather than just wise, right? So who, what, when, where, why, and how are the four, uh, are the five Y's and uh, H, which essentially, and there are some sample questions that I've written here, right? Which essentially would give you more insights uh, from where you started with. So 
I have personally used both these in the same interview. So start with the five whys, and then I have some topics to cover, and then I use this to expand them further. So that was to dig deeper, and this one is to expand to understand what is going around as well, right? So when I start with a problem statement and try and ask five questions digging deeper, right? Uh, I get some topics and uh, things to work upon, and those would then be used in the five W and H to again understand what is going around, when does it occur, who all are involved, where and why and how and all of that, right? So that again expands your gamut and gives you the bigger picture as well. So you might be solving a problem, digging deeper, and you would have a perspective from that particular person that you're interviewing with that first technique, but this would really help you to understand what is going around it could be the way of working in an organization it could be the manager that is asking the person to work in a certain way or it could be the tool that is not allowing them or the machine or the environment itself right these techniques would really help you to get into those aspects as well all right so that's how do we take interviews right how do we plan what are the topics that we would want to cover? We capture all of that. We use these two techniques and uh, conduct interviews. All right. Um, any questions? Was it easy enough for you guys to understand? Is it confusing? I'll take it's that. Easy, not confusing. Sorry, go ahead. Did somebody say something? Yes, no. Yeah, um, I think Ambilika said that it is not confusing. It is, this is great. Uh, what I feel is, you know, um, all of, so there is so much of information on the net, but then when you see something which is uh, organized in a manner that you can really act, uh, you know, use it, really apply it and access it uh, at an organization level, I think this is great. This is great job, Gaurav. Amazing. Thank you for this. Worries? All right, there are two more things that I want to cover today. We have eight minutes left, but I think I'll be able to do that. So let me also cover these two. Um, all right. So I talked about extreme and lead users, right? Uh, this is a, a guide to understand who these users are, right? So we were trying to interview people, for example, right? So we defined the problem statement. We went ahead, looked at the design principles. If they were not defined, we defined it for a particular, uh, for a large scale product or, or, a, or an organization. If they already existed, we went through and looked at that. Uh, with the problem statement, we then said that, let's look at the, uh, let's talk to the people, right? It could be multiple people. It doesn't have to be the user work who's going to use the system, but essentially it could be anyone, right? Who is a stakeholder? And we'll talk about what the stakeholder is in a while. But with that, we also define the extreme users and the lead users. And having a differentiation with them is also one of the pieces that would help you satisfy one of the principles that we defined uh, in our design principles, where we said that design for everyone. Now, this is the place where we design for everyone, right? So uh, a lead user uh, is a user that has a strong need and has solutions, workarounds already in place. These would be the smart people that you would be working with. So if you are trying to get in touch with people who have, uh, who have been using a system or a tool that already exists, right? They would have found out ways to do things. Uh, so I'll give you an example. They, we were talking to somebody, uh, and I think Rupali and I discussed about this, right? We were talking, we were working with a customer called uh, ALI, uh, and uh, we were chatting with them, and we said that you would have to have a specific format to import content, and they were they said that we have Word documents, and you don't have a place to inject Word documents into your tool, and uh, how do we do that? We said that you'd have to build a utility and we'll, we can enable this for you and so on and so forth, right? So 
those were the conversations that somebody had with the customer when we went in for uh, for a discovery phase we all we found that they have already found out a way to inject their word documents into a uh, one of our softwares one of our products and you would be amazed to hear that they figured out a tool a browser based tool over the internet that converts HTML, uh, sorry, converts Word documents into HTML outputs. And they copy pasted that into the code view and created a, a, a lesson out of it. Now, the good part here is they had already figured out a way, but not everyone can do that. And we assume that these are curriculum people and they would not be tech savvy and they would need help which could cost them some hundred thousand dollars to build a seamless integration and a workflow which would really help them dump some word documents or transcripts or um, storyboards which would transform them into beautiful lessons uh, into a format that we expect uh, we accept sorry in our um, software they had already figured out a way to do that so think about your hundred thousand dollars are gone <laughs> because somebody has already figured it out. So these are the lead users. We need to create solutions that would help these lead users as well. They don't have a need. They would have already figured out a need uh, and a solution. Then there are second types of users who are extreme users, who are who is an active user. An extreme user goes beyond the usual usage limit and utilizes the product system significantly more than an average user. Extreme users have more experience than average users. This means that their needs can be more prominent. They would call out on their problems. These could be your um, users, uh, a large base of users that you'd want to work with. And uh, their needs un uh, the needs uncovered with the group of extreme users are often well-developed uh, needs, right? So let's define some characteristics here. So the lead user is ahead of the trend. They are hard to find. They would be only a few, but they are willing to invest in resources and very experienced and well-connected. They are usually... Um, uh, very they all usually give very good insights and they are uh they can you i mean the the procedure is trend insights and they help in co-creation to a certain extent but the extreme users are the one that you work with right they are either young or old they would have difficulties to use a system or a tool or a process they are easy to find because they are the majority and they uh, and they are useful uh, for additional information because you would interview them and you would uncover lots of things that they go through in their daily lives which you would want to solve and they are the ones who would probably use to build personas and refine problem statements now understanding both these users is really critical because you'd find them in every project believe me you'd find them in every project if you've done your due diligence if you've spoken to the customer if you've spoken to the sponsors you would find these users so finding both of them and creating a solution that works for both of them is going to be this one of the success criteria, if you if you will, for the solution that you design. All right. And the last thing that I want to cover today, and I'll take questions after this, uh, is the stakeholder. Having a definition of what the stakeholder is, who is it, and how do we use them is very, very important. So creating a stakeholder map really helps you define who you are working with, right? The people who have a claim or an interest or in the problem and a potential solution. Uh, they obtain valuable information or for strategic and communicative planning as well as future activities, make assumptions about the influence of certain actors in the project. Uh, compile a list of all the relevant stakeholders. It could be your internal stakeholders, external stakeholders. Uh, uh, if you're working with a company in between, then they are also your stakeholder and the end user is also your stakeholder, right? Ask specific questions and define them into different categories. And the categories are as follows. There is a customer and a user, right? A person who's actually going to use your system. There are internal stakeholders, people, who you would work with internally as a group 
right? Uh, it could be the tech folks, it could be anyone else. Right? There are external stakeholders. External stakeholders are the ones who would influence, but are not the ones who would really be using it, but are important, right? It could be people at the customer side. And then there are public stakeholders who you would want to satisfy with the solution that you're defining so that it doesn't become uh, something that is against uh, a larger audience. There are definitions uh, that are available in this document, but essentially defining them so that you know who all are going to be involved, right? A person like your CEO to a person who is the CEO of the customer, they're also part of this because they are stakeholders who are either decision makers or can influence the decision. So while you start a, a problem or while you work on it, please define who are your stakeholders, who you can go to at the various stages of your design process or implementation process or the usability testing or any of those different stages is really critical. So defining them, also keeping the extreme and the lead users that we talked about in the previous document, assigning them here in this uh, category is also critical so that you know what you're doing. Since this was understanding phase, all the things that I talked about from problem statement to design principles to interviewing to understand, defining your extreme and lead users and the stakeholder, it's all understanding. We're not designing yet, we haven't gone anywhere to observe people. We haven't really figured out the problems. We are only understanding people and the problem and the stakeholders and the company and the brand and the principles. All right. This is where we end today. But if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take you. Anyone? Monday morning. OK, uh, I'll start a bit late because I you know, just expecting others also to talk and question. And Gaurav, if you can go back to the extreme and lead users slide, um, mm -hmm. okay, I have a question there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, where you have a definition. Um, OK. Okay, so these are so when you say lead users or lead users are more like um, users that who are you know would want to have a solution, will look for a solution, and uh, that is what it is, right? So they are always exploring by themselves um, and uh, would want to come. Okay, when you say extreme users, um, these are 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 you saying that anybody who is not a lead user everything everybody else you put it in the bucket of extreme users yep 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 so i mean the if you if you read the first sentence i think that would help you understand this so lead user is a power user yeah who knows way be beyond what we expect yeah. him or her to know an extreme user is an active user who would use it and he has a need and he urges for a solution so when we are working with say uh a team, uh, and let's take some external examples, right? If you're trying to build, say, a tool like InfoWeb, for example, right? For our uh, instructional design team, for example, right? Somebody like Sucheta would fall into the lead user category. She mm -hmm. knows way beyond what we expect her to know. She has far bigger problems to solve, and she has workarounds for every problem that we're trying to give solution for. OK. An extreme user would be an instructional designer who's that active user who's really looking for a solution, who has way bigger problems to solve and probably would have more answers to give, right? And uh, would be your real user in a way, right? Both of them are user, right? But essentially, he, the if you look at the majority, extreme users are your majority and lead users are the power ones. <laughs> Okay, and there uh, would be users who are also in the periphery, who are not direct users, and of course they are not lead users. They are those are my stakeholders. Those are not my users. Right. I'll 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 tag them as stakeholders. They are probably internal, external, or customer, or public, right? But they are stakeholders. They would have interest. They would have influence. They would have uh, decision making power, but they're not going to use your system. Got it. 
Okay. So, for example, if you if if you're building a tool like Frost, right? Uh, yeah. Somebody like a Nachiket Paratkar or Sam or Ganesh or I mean, who I mean, name them? You, you already know them, right? I shouldn't be naming them, but essentially they would have lots of ideas. They would have seen way more systems than you expect them to, right? They are closer to the customer. They have seen competition, and they would have influence, but they're not going to sit and use your tool. So they are my stakeholders essentially. But I, if I work with a Sucheta or a Victoria or um, somebody else, right? They are probably going to have, get their hands dirty here, so they become my lead users. Right. Okay. Either they're going to review a document or they're going to review a lesson or do copy editing or do something, right? Or they would probably assign people to do their yeah. jobs but they would probably be in a lead user category since you mentioned frost okay um i understand you know some of us here will not be able to understand sorry that's the example that i always give easy to give yeah so <clears throat> because frost is something that is not used by students as such you know directly not used by students yeah. but they are the eventual users of the content right Yes. How would you place them? Would you place them as users or would you place them as stakeholders? They are my stakeholders. Okay. They are my stakeholders. They are my customer slash user. Uh, so, uh, okay, let me yeah. go back to that tab now. I think that would make sense. All right. So they would fall into this bucket here, the first circle. Okay. So I would have my users extreme as well as lead into this bucket, but I would also have state students here who are not my direct consumers of the product, but they are the consumers or the customer of my end product indirectly, but they are. Right? So they become my they become my customer stakeholder. If you know what I'm right. saying. Could you, if you don't put them in that list, in the earlier list that you had, would mm -hmm. you ignore them? But you know, mm -hmm. are there chances of ignoring them if you're not going to be studying them as much? No, you, you would not because essentially they're going to somewhere influence, right? So stakeholders okay. are primarily who can influence. So if your end experience is not at par as, as what the students would expect, which are going to be your customers here, right? They're not your direct customers, but they're indirect customers, essentially, right? Having a know-how of your stakeholders itself means that you would probably try to dig deeper into who they are and what they do and what they go through and how do we satisfy their needs. Right. So as a product, our product would be great, but the output is crappy, right? So I might have satisfied my uh, extreme and lead users, but I am not able to satisfy my stakeholders. That's where stakeholder map is useful. All right. OK, yeah. That so I'm not designing for him, but I'm also designing for him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I'm also designing for Sam and Nachiket, isn't it? Correct. Because they can question my design somewhere. Correct. Yes, Prabhupada. Yeah, I know. So, uh, is end user and extreme user is are set? Mm, say that again. Is end user and extreme user are same? They are no. same category. Yeah. The, so, end user, end user is the one who's going to use it, right? End user is a very broad term. It doesn't mean anything, right? All your stakeholders could be your uh, end users. Your lead user could be your end user, your extreme user could be your lead user, and uh, your external stakeholders or internal stakeholders or the public stakeholders could also be your end user. So end user is a very broad term. That's why we define the extreme and lead, uh, extreme and lead as well as the stakeholder, which would somewhere allow you to put them in different buckets so that you can also focus on them when there is a need rather than trying to get overwhelmed with 10,000 people's need that you'd want to solve. 
So it's just terminology, Prabir, and I think uh, everyone that you're okay. working with is your end user or who's going to consume your product is your end user. Okay. okay. Thank you. So if you are trying to build an LMS learning management system, for example, right? Mm. Essentially, a learning management system would be used to teach or assign lessons or uh, use a event manage use as events to connect with students. Uh, the primary users would be your teachers and uh, students, right? But then there are other people as well who would influence, like administrators, like school staff, like principals, and so so many other people, right? So they become your stakeholders, but they're also your users. So if you say end user, it's everyone. Because they're going to log into your learning management system. As soon as they log in, they become your end user, right? But you're not designing for them. You're designing for the experience of your student and teacher, and they become your extreme and lead users primarily. Uh, um, to a certain extent, yes. Pain and gains of stakeholder definition would also be important to a certain extent, uh, depends on the size and what you're trying to do. For example, uh, I would take an example of the pro project that I work right now. There are lots of things that uh, the customer CEO tells us. And uh, it's either his uh, pains from the existing system or the, or the beautiful things that you see as gains from the existing system. That becomes, that takes a direction somewhere because he's an important stakeholder, right? And takes a direction and lands up into the roadmap of problems that we'd want to solve. Now, whether did we interview him uh, directly? Yes, we did. But do we talk to him frequently about his problems with every problem that we're trying to solve? No. But we did interview him when we started the engagement. We do talk to him every now and then, whenever there is an opportunity. He walks up or I walk up to him, but it's not for an interview, but essentially his point of views, which could be treated like pains and gains. So yes, it is important. It is critical, but you as your, as a, as a facilitator or as a designer, you define when do you want to speak to all of these stakeholders? Are they important at that point in time in the project? Remember, I talked about this uh, mindset where you need to be aware of where you are at in the design process, in the project, in the, in the engagement, in the relationship with the customer. That is where you wisely take a decision and say, do I define the pains and gains of this particular stakeholder? Maybe yes, maybe no. And you would have the answer for that. All right. Any other suggestions, points, questions before we wrap our day? Hey, hi, Gaurav Nilesh. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, when we talk about interviews, so is there a good number that we look at, uh, or is there any proportion that you break into that if we have around, say, uh, fifty interviews conducted, then I need this category to of uh, users to, uh, you know, to have at least. 40% of the users should be out of this category. Depends on what you're trying to achieve and the size of your project and your um, and your budgets. Uh, I have normally used the thumb rule of five. Um, because they are qualitative interviews, they're not about quantity. If it is about quantity, I would probably use five uh, if I'm doing a usability test. Not right now, but probably later in the game. Right. Um, I would use five because that gives me enough insights and direction towards what I'd want to rectify as a problem that I'd want to solve from the tests that and the results that came out. But when I'm trying to do, when I'm in this phase and I'm trying to understand people and uh, again, I'm just observing them, right? I'm not really getting into the, uh, sorry, I'm really understanding. I'm not into the observe yet. 
So if I'm trying to just understand, five is a good number, uh, but it also includes your stakeholders to a certain extent, right? Because you'd want to validate your problem statements. For example, with the project sponsor, you'd want to talk to a few teachers if you are working with the teachers. You'd want to talk to a few students, but please understand that not everyone would understand the problem. There could be some ideas. Again, it's a gut feeling, like I said. There could be certain ideas or a feature that nobody has thought about. It has come from some uh, some uh, executive, right? How do you achieve? Uh, how do you approach a student and trying to answer, ask questions to that student, is up to you. So again, it really matters. There is no number. There is no thumb rule for defining that. If you do testing towards the end, then I can give you a number. But when you're trying to understand and when you're trying to observe people, you define them into different buckets, like I said. And as long as you're touching each, each bucket, you'd be fine. You, you could be with one user in each bucket, or you could probably do like 10. Again, like I said, depends on your time lens, depends on your budget, depends on how much time you'd want to spend here uh, versus how much time you'd want to spend uh, in the next future phases. Thanks. There are other tools, however, which we use uh, to run design sprints. And uh, the design sprint says that you can use eight as a good number, which includes stakeholders from various levels, which also includes real users. But if you have eight people coming from different genres, for example, that's good enough to have a point of view, which is easier to understand and then solve. All right, anyone else? Okay, I thank all of you for spending Monday morning with me. We will continue this with uh, the observe phase of empathy and uh, try and go forward with uh, the define phase tomorrow. We'll see how much we can cover, but uh, let's let's try and meet tomorrow same time. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. For your Sunday Thank you. evening, and we'll be meeting half an hour earlier tomorrow. Mm, yes. News for you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's.